Welcome to the Cambridge Service Alliance webinar series. Today I am, it's my pleasure to present Tim Pierce, and he's going to talk about, about Bayesian neural networks and some moves. Over to you. Yeah, thanks for joining uh, those on the line. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be I'm going to be taking you through uh, sort of a nice overview of the work I've been doing over the like the past six months. Um, so I'm going to be covering a little bit about the, the working paper um, that was attached as part of the CSA series, but I'm also going to be talking about some work around it um, and trying to focus on sort of the experiments rather than the technical details. So I'm going to start with an idea with a um, oh man. There we go. So I'm going to start with an example of a sort of slightly cartoony example of why we might want to um, be able to quantify uncertainty in AI applications. So here we've got a situation where we have some type of neural network um, that is um, part of a self-driving car system. Um, so it's taking as input maybe the sort of video on top of the car and it's outputting actions that the car should take so you know turn left turn right straight brake um, and in this image here we, we've got something that seems like quite a typical uh, sort of driving like road scene so you would hope that the neural network would simply stay okay i've seen this before lots of times you know i've learned that you should just keep going straight here like there's nothing too strange going on um, on the other hand, we might have quite a different situation uh, that if you're deploying these systems might actually come up. So here we've got a situation that might be quite far from the data that the system has learned on or been trained on. Um, so maybe it's been trained on like urban streets in, in sort of first world countries. And here we've suddenly got a giraffe crossing the road. And the problem is with, the, with kind of modern AI systems, they don't, they're not very good at recognizing their uncertainty. So in this situation, they would generally just make a decision. Um, so they might say, okay, continue straight, turn left, break. It's kind of anybody's guess what they're gonna um, do, but you kind of know that it's gonna be, uh, it's likely to be garbage since it hasn't seen this example before. And I suppose that the work that I'm doing um, basically reason, basically says that if your neural network is aware of its uncertainty, rather than kind of spitting out this, this garbage prediction, um, you can actually just say, um, no, I'm, un I'm unsure about this. I'm going to refrain from making a strong prediction. Um, and in that case, it's kind of, you can then implement like a sort of more risk aware, safer AI system. So if you hear you say, I'm unsure about this, therefore we're going to hit the brakes, reduce speed something like that and have a bit of like um, simple logic afterwards. Um, so there's a couple of different reasons why you might uh, want uncertainty with, with your AI systems. So I've kind of, the example I've given there is, is kind of that top one, which is uncertainty for decision-making sake. Um, there's also a subfield of machine learning called active learning, uh, where it's useful for, it's useful to present adversarial attacks and also to drive the exploration process and reinforcement learning. And I'm gonna to touch a little bit on these, uh, on the last two examples uh, later on in the talk. So the question is, how, how, do, we, how do we go about uh, sort of quantifying our uncertainty in these, in these AI systems? Um, and a sort of very widely accepted framework to dealing with uncertainty is given by the Bayesian framework. Um, so I'm not going to go into to sort of too much detail if, if you're not familiar with um, sort of Bayesian philosophy. Um, but the general idea is we, we have some sort of a prior belief, uh, then you kind of look at uh, the, what the data actually says, and your sort of posterior, the thing that you actually output is somewhere in between the two things. And this turns out to be a really useful framework for dealing with uncertainty. Um, now, typically neural networks don't use this framework. So um, the top half of this slide has just like a regular neural network uh, with point estimates for all the weights. And what that means is you feed in uh, point estimates on the left there, so you've got some values for X that you feed in. The neural network does some operation on it, 
and then it spits out a point estimate. And the point is that point estimate doesn't really have any, any uncertainty. Um, on the other hand, if you um, actually kind of model your weights as distributions, uh, you can in, have the same input, and instead of having a point estimate, you then have a distribution for your output, and that's a distribution over possible values, um, which is kind of the definition of uncertainty, at least from a mathematical sense. So it's quite a simple idea, actually, like really Bayesian neural networks are as simple as that. Um, the, the, the trouble comes um, in trying to do Bayesian inference over these really big neural networks that might have millions of parameters. Uh, they're typically associated with huge data sets as well. So a lot of the Bayesian methods we, that work really well for small scale settings just don't scale up to this. So really a lot of the work going on within Bayesian deep learning, uncertainty in neural networks, any of these types of terms, terms is basically trying to address these problems. Now, one un-Bayesian approach to, to dealing with uncertainty uh, in neural networks is quite a simple idea uh, called ensembling. So here, rather than having a single neural network, what we're gonna do is have a small number of individual neural networks. So here we've got three distinct neural networks. Um, and what you find is that you, you sort of start them all from different initializations, which means they all have slightly different forms before they've been trained. You then sort of show them some data. And what you find is in regions where you've seen data, they all converge to very similar estimates. And in regions where you haven't seen data, they kind of keep some diversity. So a heuristic explanation for that is, um, you know, these ensembles, they kind of learn to, to output the same um, estimates where they've seen data. But if they see some new training, some new data point in, in the real world, they're kind of going to know that they're uncertain about it. And this is kind of a really nice, simple idea. Um, and it works pretty well empirically. Uh, unfortunately, the community has really favored this Bayesian framework. And they've sort of not been a too big a fan of this, I would say, uh, on aggregate. And so a lot of the work I've been doing has basically been trying to take this idea of ensembling, this quite simple idea, um, and try to connect it with this Bayesian uh, framework so that it's a bit more kind of rigorous, let's say. So I'm not going to kind of go too much into the details of this. So, so the working paper that the CSA released um, sort of gives a, a lot of technical detail about behind uh, sort of the methods that I've generated. Um, but, but just to kind of give a brief overview here, so, so on the right um, gives the predictive distribution that we would ideally like to see. Um, and on the left here are kind of different types of ensembling uh, that, that have been used in the literature. And we find that if you use this unregularized type, um, it kind of captures some uncertainty on the left there, but it tends to kind of overfit. If you use regular, something called regularized neural networks, you're kind of encouraging all networks to the same solution, uh, which is a bit of a problem for other reasons. And the bottom there uh, is the method that I've been proposing um, and kind of digging into the theory behind, which is which we've named anchored uh, ensembling or anchored neural networks. And we find that that distribution tends to be a lot more similar to, to, to the real sort of ground truth um, thing that we're trying to output. Um, and I'm not gonna to go too much into detail with this slide here, but, but what I basically wanted to show is, is, is on the left, we kind of have, again, these sort of ground truth methods that, that are really accurate, but unfortunately don't scale up well to, to sort of big problems. Um, the, the red box here are kind of common practical methods that are trying to approximate these guys on the left um, and their scalable approximations. Um, so they're practical, but they, they're not always a, such a great um, you know, reflection of that. I and mean, the, the point of this is we're trying to show that at least qualitatively, um, our method, our, the anchored on something kind of um, gives you a practical method that does give a good reflection of the ground truth. Um, one question I, I often get asked is um, how many neural networks you need in an ensemble? People sometimes get a bit worried about, um, oh, you know, maybe you need like a thousand neural nets. 
Um, here's kind of a it's, it's a bit of a toy demonstration still, but, but we show as as you increase the number of neural networks in your ensemble. Um, so if you have just three, then it's kind of a, a bit of a shaky uh, distribution, a bit of a wobbly looking distribution. And as you increase, by the time you've got to sort of ten or twenty, um, you've generally got a pretty good pre um, approximation of, of the ground truth. Um, we've sort of argued in the paper that that this number of so, so we, we recommend 10 as kind of rule of thumb. Um, we, re, we in, the, in the paper, we, we try to argue that 10, this number 10 doesn't really increase with the number of inputs. Um, the, the, there's a bit of a doubt in my mind about the number of outputs of your dimension, um, but I think it's probably not a bad place to start. And then everything we've talked about so far is, is um, a regression problem. So in machine learning, you tend to have uh, typically two broad classes of problem. You have a regression where you're trying to predict some scalar value, so maybe like a person's height or like a time to an event or something like that. Um, and then on the other hand, you might have these binary things that you're trying to predict. So is someone healthy or, is, or are they not? Um, you know, does this machine need to be fixed or does it not? These kind of binary things. Um, and we've showed here basically that the, the anchored ensemble can equally be applied to classification as well as uh, regression. Um, and again, we've kind of got these different types of ensembles. We've got unregularized, which sort of overfits the data, uh, regularized neural nets, which kind of uh, don't overfit, but they tend to all hit the same solutions. And then bottom left is, is sort of the method that we're pro propose, proposing, these anchored neural nets. And we compare that to the ground truth and find that it's uh, not too dissimilar. And I'm going to share with you now some, some results that are pretty hot off the press. So this is stuff I've done in the last couple of weeks, actually. So this kind of ties back to the original example we showed at this, I showed at the start of the slides, which was to do with this um, image example where you maybe have um, some uh, system that's tra trained on a road scene and then it sees like a, a, a new situation that it's not come across in the training data. So here we trained, uh, we, we sort of did a bit of a simpler example um, where we trained a neural network to classify images from, from a data sort of set called Fashion MNIST. So there's sort of 10 classes in this. You get like jumpers, bags, shoes, trousers, these sorts of things. And your neural network has to learn to classify um, each of these things. And so, so the models we are training, it tends to get about 90% accuracy, which is not quite state of the art, but it's, it's not too bad. Um, and the interesting thing we did in this work then was we said, OK, given that we've trained it on these sort of um, examples, we then want to test it on things that it hasn't been seen before. So in these edge cases, we actually held out a couple of the clothing types. So we, we held out trousers and also sneakers. Um, so we kind of call these edge cases where they're nearly what, what you would have seen in the training data, um, but a little bit different. Then we had out of training distribution. Um, a lot of people, a lot of other, a lot of the literature talks about out of distribution data. And this, these are examples of that. So where you maybe have the original data set, but there are some manipulations applied to them. So either flipped upside down, maybe inverted, or maybe have like a completely new um, data point. So this is kind of the equivalent maybe of like a giraffe that you've never seen before. Um, so we've got like the classic MNIST set or some real, real world photo images. And then we also have adversarial examples, which are kind of, you can think of this as like specially designed noise to try to fool. Um, the networks. And I haven't got time to kind of go through the, the full results, um, but, but the, some high level um, numbers just to put out there shows that the method uh, that we've produced compared to if you used a single neural network, um, you reduce your overconfident predictions for the edge cases by 23%, um, for the out of trading distribution ones by 55%. And it works really surprisingly well for the adversarial examples, at least the ones that we showed it. Um, and, it and it's almost kind of immune to, to a certain class that we showed it. 
Um, and so, so there are those top numbers that are compared to a single neural network, which typically typically is what you would see um, in production for, for, say, an autonomous driving system. And then the bottom one there is comparing our, on, our Enkid Ensemble method compared to a regularized ensemble, which is kind of um, a bit more similar. And we find that it still beats it, although a little bit less uh, well. And I think for the last five minutes, I just wanted to uh, talk about something a little bit different now, a little bit of a, a different application, which is within a reinforcement learning setting. So we're kind of moving away from the supervised learning setting here, and we're doing things like you might have heard about systems that can play Go or chess. Um, uh, the, these sorts of systems kind of require a bit of a different framework. Um, so I'm going to start off with an example where this is quite a classic reinforcement learning task, uh, just as a kind of toy scenario where you have this cart and you have a pole and you have to learn the agent, let me say the AI has to learn to move the cart left or right in order to keep the pole balanced. And so we're going to see um, the, the, the training that happened using the anchor ensemble that we generated. So at the start of training, it kind of every time it twitches, that, that's the environment kind of resetting because it's failed. Um, it pretty quickly learns like the direct mechanics of, of the thing. Um, but what you find is it, it'll then start kind of hitting the wall. Um, and it, it takes a little bit longer for it to realize that, that you should avoid the wall as well. Um, but we did some really interesting analysis um, with this anchored ensemble technique where we, um, I'm going to talk about this more later if, if we don't have too many questions that come up. Um, but we did, did a little bit of analysis where we kind of showed the agent several situations, several types of situation and sort of saw how confident it was in these. Um, but as I say, I might come back to that if we have some time later. Um, okay, and then, yeah, the, 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 fun, the sort of last situation I wanted to talk about, um, we're then taking this, um, so, so the car pole is a very kind of toy experiment in reinforcement learning, and I was quite interested to see how, how it could be applied to robotics. Um, so again, this is a very recent, recent work that I've been doing in the last couple of weeks. Um, so there's again quite a quite a standard sort of benchmarking robotic data set where you have to do various tasks. So on the bottom there you have like some like a robotic hand and it has to learn to manipulate a block into like a certain orientation. Um, the one that we've applied it to so far uh, basically is that top left one where you the robot has to learn to move to a certain point in space. So there's like, so, so this red dot is going to be like the target that the thing has to move towards. And the closer it gets, the kind of higher the reward it gets. So on the left there, we've got kind of, it's just moving completely randomly. So that's at zero episodes of training. Um, and what you find is, you know, just, just by mistake, sometimes it, it sort of drifts towards the point and it receives a better reward. And that kind of gives it good feedback for saying, yeah, let's do that more often. Um, and so after a thousand episodes, it sort of starts to, to get an idea of what, of what it should be doing. Um, so it starts sort of drifting towards the point, uh, but a little bit slowly. Um, and then after about 4,000 episodes, it's kind of as good as it, as it gets, uh, where it moves pretty directly towards it. The reason it still looks a little bit shaky is that we've kind of injected a bit of noise into the problem uh, just to, to make it into a bit more of an interesting problem for, uh, for, for the methods to solve, let's say. Um, but yeah, this is something we've been doing um, the last, as I say, the last week. So we've kind of been starting to implement this with the anchor ensemble and, tr and trying to evaluate um, any performance gain that it might have. Um, so that's more or less um, what I wanted to talk about um, immediately. Um, so the, the, the things that I've talked about today kind of piece together three different papers. Uh, so, so the one on the right here is, is the one that we sort of officially presented as the 
CSA working paper, but it also draws on a couple of other connected pieces of work that I've done. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to take it if there are any um, pressing questions out there, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, I can talk a little bit more about that section that I um, said that I'd be happy to come back to. Thank you very much. I think that we still have some time if you wanted to talk about uh, Yeah, happy to do so. Uh, I'm not sure how it, would people just type in with questions. Is that uh, okay? We, uh, for people uh, for people uh, wanting to ask questions, you either raise your hand or uh, dismute yourself and ask the question. Alternatively, you can email us or send us a text by chat and we can pass the, the question to them. So meanwhile, yeah. uh, people start uploading their questions, maybe you can come back. Yeah, cool, great. Yeah. Um, I think this other bit is one of my favorite um, things I've done during my PhD. So, so we're getting back to this idea of um, this carpool thing, right? So, so we've trained it. Um, so it's kind of learned learn by itself to, to balance this pole. Um, and, you know, the, the, the whole kind of philosophy behind my work is that uh, the AI or the agent should be aware of its uncertainty. And so to assess whether it had actually learned this correctly, what we did is we kind of came up with three types of situation. Um, and we kind of looked at how certain it was. So the first situation here, uh, we, we've sort of called this um, a stable state. So this is when the uh, cart is right in the middle of the environment and the pole is perfectly balanced. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether it moves left or right, um, or we know that. Um, and it also would have seen this state a lot of times, you would expect during training. So you would expect it to be very confident of that. Now on the bottom plots, um, uh, the, you have two lines. Uh, one is for how good the agent thinks moving right is, which is the red line. And the other one is how good uh, it would be to move left. And if you have a broad distribution, that means that it's very unsure because you kind of have this broad distribution over a lot of values. And if you have a tight distribution, it means it's quite certain. Um, so for this at episode one, uh, both the left and the right actions are, are pretty similar and they're both quite broad, which means they would be quite unsure about both of those. By the time you get to episode 800, um, what you find is, is both the distributions get quite peaked, which means that it's pretty sure of, of how good each of the actions is. And the other interesting thing about this is it's learned that they're both the same value because it's completely centered. Doesn't really matter whether it moves left or right. Um, so that was kind of a good first, first tick for our method. Um, the second state we looked at was uh, what we called an unstable state where there was an obvious optimal action. So we kind of just uh, created a set of inputs that said, okay, you clearly would, would want to move right in this situation. So again, on episode one, you, you find that you have this similar distribution where it's pretty, pretty unsure and pretty overlapping distributions. And then after training up to episode 800, they get again pretty peaked, perhaps not quite as peaked as last time. Um, but the interesting thing here is that they do have like a definite separation between the two things. So it's kind of learned that yes, we should definitely move right in this situation. And we're very sure about this. Now the last state that, that we, that we um, came up with really shows that the uncertainty estimates we came up with did work. Um, so we came up with a, with a set of inputs that was sort of possible, but, but was very unlikely to have occurred in real life. So here the cart was kind of right on the edge of the boundary, but it was moving very quickly into the center, um, which kind of wouldn't, you wouldn't really expect that to actually be generated much in, uh, during training. Um, and again, so, so at episode one, both the, the left and the right actions are pretty uncertain. And what was really important to see was that even after episode 800, when it was performing the task pretty well, and when for the other states, it, it had sort of learned to be quite confident about those. For these ones, it maintained quite a broad distribution, which meant that it was still um, pretty uncertain about its actions. Um, 
and that that kind of summarizes um you know the the, the uncertainty estimates we're producing um are sort of what we would want them to be so yeah that, that was just kind of the end of that section there um but yeah that's one of my favorite experiments that i've run actually as well um, tim there is a question coming so mm -hmm. the question here is that if a car a driverless car mm -hmm. is up there what will be the implications or how will you implement your methodology for a driverless car what will be mm. the first point that you will say this element will be needed here mm. in this particular car so so, so, so the nice thing about um, the methods that i've generated that i've developed um, is that I've, i've tried to stick as close as possible to how um sort of normal ai systems work so typically for like a self-driving system um at least for some of the process there's going to be like a single big neural network um and the, the method that i've then proposed basically says you don't need any big changes particularly all you do is you say rather than having that single big network we're going to maybe need five of those neural networks in that system but you don't need to radically like redesign your system or anything it kind of just fit into that space okay, um, like a more modular yeah modular. yeah i, I mean the, the, the downside is that you still need say five times as much computing power so if you're doing like real-time stuff for say self-driving cars you might need to like put another cpu or something uh, on board which may or may not be a problem depending on your application so if this is like prognostics in real time and there's you know a premium on on the amount of computing power you can put on a machine it might not be perfect if it's a self-driving car where you kind of have lots of power systems and stuff already and you know that the hassle of adding an extra cpu is not too bad then maybe it's not a bad thing to do Thank you very much. And with that, we conclude the webinar for today. Thank you very much to Tim. Great, thanks. Very fantastic uh, research, very technical, but we managed yeah. to understand you all, all the way through. Thank <laughs> you very much. I will invite you for the next webinar. And the webinar is going to talk about textual regularity mining and data-driven customer experience analytics. Please join us next month. Thank you very much.